Good evening. My name is Steve Kelling. I work at the lab of ornithology for the past 20 years. I've, I have had the opportunity to work a lot of that time with our speaker tonight. And I first, uh, I first heard of Alan Poole in the mid-90s when all of my friends and colleagues were, were thinking about this new project called the Birds of North America. And the Birds of North America was a project started by the American Ornithology Union, um, the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences, uh, that was focused on developing monographs of every species of bird that bred in North America. And very early on in the process, Alan Poole became the scientific editor of the BNA, shepherding the creation of what? 760 accounts uh, written by the foremost authorities of, of that species in the world. And um, beginning in around 2000, the uh, Lab of Ornithology got involved with the process. And we began to think about whether we could take this concept of DNA and put it on the nascent internet. And instead of having it as a single account that would be fixed in time, we would develop a, a editing process to update the accounts. And in 2003, Alan and I wrote a uh, grant proposal of the National Science Foundation, and we got money to begin putting the BNA online. Um, since then, we've, we've, um, we've updated over half the accounts in the BNA. Uh, the BNA is a lively, uh, very highly regarded um, um, monograph, arguably the best monograph, ornithological monograph in existence. Um, and there's more exciting things coming along, so stay tuned. Um, but all this time, I knew of Alan's passion for the BNA. I I'd never realized his love was for ospreys until I had the opportunity with my family to visit his house in, along the coast in Massachusetts, where he took us out to show us his birds. And... Um, from that, I realized his love of, of the osprey and his deep knowledge of that, which he's going to talk to us a bit about tonight. So it's a pleasure to introduce Alan Poole. Thank you, Steve, and thank all of you for coming out um, on such a beautiful May evening. It's sort of tempting just to keep birding and, and not even show up inside. So I'm very grateful that you're here. It's delightful for me to be back at the lab. This is my home for 10 years and a wonderful home it was. I feel honored to be here tonight. This place has so much history. There are so many people who've come through here um, to speak about um, such a variety of topics in the ornithological world. And uh, here we are surrounded by Fuerte's paintings. It, it just doesn't get any better than that. Tonight I want to um, think a little bit about ospreys with you and talk to you about some trips that I took through Europe. But I think we'll start with Roger Torrey Peterson, who, on whose shoulders so many of us here at the Lab of Ornithology stand. Let's think about it. Peterson really started America bird watching. He started the development of bird watchers. He, he cultivated bird watchers along, his, along the way with his writing and his painting. And um, here we are at the lab doing many of the same things, although in a digital age, taking advantage of newer technologies to do a lot of the same things. But Roger Peterson um, in the 1950s, early 1960s, wrote a article for National Geographic called the Osprey, Endangered World Citizen. 
And indeed it was at that point. Roger lived along the coast of Connecticut. Ospreys were in the marshes along his backyard. Um, one of his favorite birds, he was thrilled with them. And um, after two or three summers, he started noticing that at the end of the summer, he wasn't seeing very many, if any, young ospreys in the nest. The, one of the beauties of ospreys is that they nest in the open, and you can see the young in the nest when they're big. Um, they're not hidden. And so um, Peterson sounded the alarm. He was smart enough and connected enough, so he was able to get the ball rolling. This was an era when other parts of the world were also having problems with birds of prey. It's a story I'm sure many of you know. Um, but uh, it, you know, it's the story of, the, um, of contaminants, DDT particularly, thin-shelled eggs, poor reproduction, um, peregrines, uh, bald eagles, brown pelicans, and ospreys were the big four. Those were the species that were the most, the most affected. And they launched, helped launch an environmental movement in the 1970s. That was a turning point, the first Earth Day, the beginning of much of the environmental legislation that was written for our country, um, and sort of a greening of cultures. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. But what I want to do this evening is talk to you about um, what Roger was thrilled to see uh, later on in life. He lived into the 90s, so he began to see ospreys coming back to his coast there uh, in Connecticut along the New England coast. Actually, they were back in a big way by the 1990s. But the 1970s were sort of the turning point, and I was lucky enough to jump on board as a graduate student and start working on ospreys during, during those years. And I've always had them in the background. BNA was a big part of my life for 20 years, but I still kept a place on the coast, and I got back there. And when I got back there, there were ospreys to study and nests to check, and I had a little boat to get out there, and that sort of helped keep me going. It was something to go back for, and I, I love that. But what I want to talk about tonight is um, three separate populations that, in a way, um, uh, illuminate the osprey story of the last 50 of the last 50 years one of them is fairly recent it's right here in the finger lakes i could not come to the lab of ornithology and talk about ospreys in faraway places and not mention what's going on here in the finger lakes because it's nothing short of phenomenal um, also, Finland, I was lucky enough to be given um, a small grant, actually a fairly nice grant, to travel in Europe for a summer. That was three, four summers ago, 2016, three summers ago, I guess. Um, and I, there I visited um, Scotland and England, which have a um, remarkable osprey story to tell, an osprey recovery revival story. France, where um, it's just beginning to gain, gain footing, so we're seeing the revival at different stages of the game, and Finland, where people are um, determined to make ospreys uh, successful. They already are successful there. They're determined to keep that success rolling. Three different cultures, but all focused on uh, wanting ospreys to thrive. So that's our story for tonight. Um, first of all, though, I want to talk a little bit about what it is um, about the life history of ospreys that makes them a species that has been able to, um, to revive so, so well. There are particular characteristics of this bird that wouldn't work with a nuthatch or a heath hen or a, um, uh, a seabird. Um, ospreys were primed to come back, roaring back in a big way because of who they are. So let's think about who they are. First of all, they're a global species. That helps a lot. You're not just dealing with one population. You're not just dealing with a couple of populations. You're dealing with hundreds of subpopulations around the globe. Ospreys are primarily northern hemisphere breeders. So there's a, a North American population from Alaska all the way to Labrador, down into Florida, um, and along the Gulf Coast, although it stops right there from there on, from Baja south, these are all wintering birds. This map is wrong, I am sorry to say, and it got into my book. Very embarrassing. <laughs> Europe, full of ospreys, although not nearly as many as in North America, much more scattered populations with a very different history than ours. Fascinating. I'll be telling you about that. 
Australia, where there is a non-migratory resident population, ospreys that live in warm climates don't need to migrate. Makes sense. They're fish there year-round. And um, you see the same thing here in the Caribbean, where there's a tiny but very interesting population in Cuba, the Bahamas, and on down the, um, uh, the coast of the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, coast of, of Mexico, and into Belize. The other thing is that ospreys are, um, as I'm sure many of you, most of you know, they are exclusively fish eaters. They eat only live fish. Now that might seem like a real restriction. Um, it's, um, um, but there are a lot of fish in the world and um, there are a lot of places to catch fish. Keep in mind that most of the world is covered with water. Of course, a lot of that's open ocean, which isn't going to do an osprey any good. They need shallow water where fish are at the surface. Um, they need shallow water or water where fish are at the surface. They can only dive about not even a, a meter deep. So they've got to get fish up in the top layer of water. But you do the math, and there are a lot of fish species that meet that criterion, and many of those fish species are schooling species that occur in vast numbers. And so there are times when ospreys just there are so many fish that ospreys couldn't eat them if they were eating them all day long, which they wouldn't do. But. Fresh and salt water, we're dealing with a critter here that is both um, equally at home, uh, on both on, on the ocean, on coasts, in estuaries, and all across the, oops, all across the vast um, uh, freshwater lakes of Canada and Alaska, reservoirs here in the in the uh, in the western U.S. have developed large populations. Um, Great Lakes has um, significant numbers of ospreys as well. But just looking at this map, a quick overview of North America: there are something like 25 to 30,000 pairs of ospreys now in in North North America, which is more than we're here historically. We'll see why. <coughs> Places like Florida have 5,000 pairs. Florida is a hotbed for ospreys. New England has two or 3,000. Chesapeake Bay has 20% of the ospreys in the world breeding there. Over 10,000 pairs of ospreys in Chesapeake Bay. There are as many ospreys nesting in Chesapeake Bay as there are in all of Europe. The other thing about ospreys, um, there are two things that provide, that, that as a population biologist, a reproductive biologist, there are two things that limit reproduction in birds, in birds of prey. And that is um, an adequate, safe nest site and food. If you have enough food and a safe place to nest, you're going to produce young. And if you produce young, that's going to drive the population changes, the population increases in the year ahead, in the years ahead. So here's a, a typical, well, not a typical, but a, a particularly well-developed osprey nest. This one happens to be in Australia, but it could easily be here. And this is classic home life, home life of the osprey. Female probably on the nest, although they both share incubation duties. A feeding perch off to the side where the fish are consumed, um, although once the young hatch, they're consumed in the nest. Um, this is, this is the peaceful home life of all, this all is well at this osprey nest. Male is here, female is incubating, probably just caught a fish in the last couple of hours. Everybody's full, nobody's worried. Except for occasional, the occasional belligerent neighbor. Nest, um, nest is the big investment in the osprey's life and it's worth hanging on to. Especially if you're a migrant osprey, this is what you come back to. This is where you start breeding. If you don't have a nest, the odds are very good you're not gonna breed that year. Quick to adapt. This is um, most, uh, those of you around here who know Finger Lakes ospreys, I don't even, uh, I don't have to introduce this at all. You know this scene. This happens to be in Germany, but it could be in many, many other parts, many other parts of the world. Ospreys have taken over, um, are net using human structures for nest sites. Power poles are particularly attractive to them. They're nice and, nice and tall, they're up there. Um, 
They're also dangerous because they're carrying huge amounts of voltage in those lines, and ospreys can and do get electrocuted. But here, what they've done is modified this with a, a basket that's built up on the top of this, and I know the same thing is uh, happening around here and in many other parts of the world. So electric companies, we owe a lot of the revival of ospreys in various parts of the world to the kindness of electric companies. This is my, this is my home turf. This is one of my assistants helping, helping me check osprey nests on the salt marshes of Massachusetts. The point here is that they don't need a lot to nest on. Any Cub Scout could build that nest. It's not build that platform for those birds to nest on. It does not, it does not take, it's not rocket science construction at all. As long as they're up off the marsh, away from the high tide, um, uh, they're good. A predator guard wouldn't hurt. Most of our platforms are taller than this. We have 100 pairs of ospreys nesting on platforms like this within three miles of my house in Massachusetts on, the salt, on our salt marsh uh, estuaries. And these platforms are all up and down the coast, from the Carolinas to Maine to Nova, to Nova Scotia. This is the secret we talked about. Uh, I was talking about Chesapeake Bay with 10,000 pairs of ospreys. This is the secret to the osprey revival in Chesapeake Bay. There are hundreds, thousands of nests on channel markers and buoys all along the back, back reaches of Chesapeake Bay, those um, um, those tidal, some the sort of tidal and semi-tidal stretches of the bay there, and of course these are shallow waters, so the birds do uh, do very well in finding finding fish there. So on to the Finger Lakes, um, and the first question that I found myself asking: first of all, let me acknowledge that whatever I am saying here tonight about Finger Lakes ospreys was learned in the last two weeks. And who did I learn it for, from? Miss Candace Cornell. Please stand. <laughs> Candace has been doing fantastic work here for the last decade, even before that. Not only watching this, she's the ultimate watcher. Margaret Morse Nice would be proud, the ultimate watcher at the nest, but also documenting the growth, the fantastic growth of the Finger Lakes osprey population in the last decade, really. So here we go. The question is, um, are these new birds, were there, what was going on here 200 years ago with, uh, with, uh, with ospreys, or even 100 years ago? To find out, I went to the library up here at the lab of O and opened um, an ancient volume of the Birds of New York by Elton Howard Eaton. How many people in this room have ever looked at the Birds of New York by Elton Howard Eaton? Good for you. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, there you go. And the answer was right there. It turns out there weren't a lot of ospreys here. In fact, if any, there may not have been any. The, the Populations of ospreys that are historical in New York State are in eastern Long Island, where there's been a, a strong salt marsh, um, a salt marsh and estuarine population for years, especially around Gardner's Bay, Gardner's Island, eastern, eastern Long Island. The Adirondacks, scattered nesting through the Adirondacks, never a, never a big population. Hundreds of pairs on eastern Long Island, maybe 20 or 30 in all of the Adirondacks, maybe 50. Nobody really knows. Um, they haven't counted them for years. And the rest of New York, it turns out there were few or none historically. So I think to answer this question, we should call it an invasion. And invasion it is. Thank you, Candace, for these data. Here you go, 1999, fewer than 10 pairs in the Cayuga Basin, most of those, most of those in Montezuma, and since then, 2018, almost 100 pairs, 90, 90, 90 pairs. Am I, am I right in that? Yes, okay. Actually, those are the ones, this whole um, public land. There's 10 more on private land. There you go. See, I said, I, I said 100 is prob probably it. This is what I find utterly fascinating. The growth, most of the growth has taken place since 2013. Um, 
admittedly there were 20 plus nests, so it had already grown there, but this is exponential growth. in bird. You rarely see this in bird populations. It truly is extraordinary, and especially extraordinary with large birds of prey that have slow Breed, that have relatively slow breeding rates. So these birds may have been coming in from, part of it was probably local reproduction. They just reached a point where there were enough of them producing enough young. Ospreys tend to return to the area where they were born as breeders. Not the immediate area, but close by. Um, they could also have come, Steve Kelling was suggesting that some of these birds may have come from the Great Lakes, where there apparently is la are large and robust populations along, along the northern and eastern reaches of Lake Ontario. Do I have that right? Yeah. Okay. So here we go. Uh, I, I think I'm preaching the choir here. A lot of you know all, know all this already, but um, I find it fascinating. Again, this is typical. You can see this all over the world, where um, phone pole for electric poles are being fitted um, to accommodate osprey nests. Keep in mind this takes time and it takes money. These things don't, these aren't mushrooms. They don't spring up overnight. Somebody has to get in a bucket truck and go up and do that work. Not only that, somebody has to call the guy in the bucket truck so they can come and do it. So each one of these have required quite a bit of work. Um, this happens to be the western U.S., but it could easily, it could easily be here. This is very professional work, um, a guy. There is now a guy living in in um, Oregon or Washington, I can't remember, but um, who runs a business called Osprey Solutions, LLC. <laughs> this is how you know Ospreys have experienced a revival. There's a guy making a living fixing Osprey problem nests. I think probably most of you know this, know this nest. Again, think of how few birds would be tolerant enough to nest at the top of a light structure on a soccer field where those lights are probably going for four or five hours every evening. That's not your average hawk. The other thing that's been, I think, driving the expansion, um, the, the really fast growth of ospreys here in, in the Finger Lakes Bay, in the Cayuga Basin particularly, is, um, and by the way, most of this growth has been in, in, around Lake Cayuga, not the other Finger Lakes, um, <laughs> is um, the large extent of shallow water at both the north and the south end of, lake, of the lake. Candace has alerted me, alerted me to this, and here you see that, um, See them with a bullhead. That's a shallow water. That's a shallow water fish. Um, they're getting perch as well. Some trout. I understand those are sort of the big three. Um, but it takes shallow water to fuel that kind of um, to produce three young broods, which is the most that ospreys are able to do. When you see three young in a nest, you know the ospreys are in good shape. And you see this reflected in the current placement of osprey nests. Notice that most of them are at the north end of the lake. There are also quite a few down at the south. A lot fewer in the central, er in the central areas there where water is deeper and shallows are less accessible. Fish probably harder to get. So my congratulations to you. You've got a fantastic population here. You're, you're just where we were 20 or 30 years ago. Your population is just taking off. And it's going to be fascinating to see where it lands, so to speak. What Almost all these populations grow and then level out. What is going to be the leveling point for <coughs> Finger Lakes ospreys here? I have no idea, no way to predict that. But part of the answer is going to be when people get tired of building nest sites. <laughs> OK, we're going to shift gears here. and. Um, <laughs> Uh, a case of beer to anybody who can tell me what any one of these words mean. <laughs> okay, we're in Finland. The great, boreal, the great northern boreal forests of Scandinavia have been the heartland of ospreys um, in Europe. Most of the rest of Europe's ospreys got wiped out, not so much by pesticides the way it was here, but um, um, by what we call persecution, which means basically shooting them or trapping them. 
And one of the reasons Europe was particularly prone to shooting and trapping was that Europe is a country, is an area full of fish farms. Um, keep in mind, um, going back to the edict of the Pope, you eat fish on Fridays. So everybody in Europe, mostly, not everybody, but a lot of Europe was eating fish on Fridays. That meant a lot of guys were making money selling fish from the, out of their backyard. And when ospreys showed up, they were not happy. Quick glance at um, where, they're, where they're found. Again, 95% of the ospreys are from um, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Eastern uh, and Western, Western Russia. These, those big, huge boreal forests that are still left there. Far fewer numbers, although a very interesting story that I'll tell you about in just a little bit here in the United Kingdom, Scotland particularly, but also now in England. Um, whoops, beginning to, just beginning to, um, Osprey's just beginning to come back to areas like Germany and France, Spain and Portugal. One of the reasons that, um, I just love this picture. <laughs> It, 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 it's summer, it, it is the essence of Finland. <laughs> Only a Finn would climb 60 feet up to the top of a tree and build a nest for an osprey, which is what they do year after year. There are over 100 people that are part of the osprey network in Finland. And their, their job is to find nests, particularly nests in precarious situations, and shore them up Make sure they're solid, make sure they last for decades, and that's, and that's what they do. Finland has about 1,500, 12, 1,500 pairs of ospreys. Fairly steady population since it's been monitored over the last 30 years or so. Slow growth, thanks to work like this. Every single young that fledges from a nest in Finland is given a band. So that's 1,500 nests figure roughly two young per nest, that's 3,000 young that are found in the back reaches of the Finnish forest. These guys are trekking through these forests for days on end. I think one of the advantages for Finland, it just struck me when I visited there, was um, they've got a long fishing day. It barely gets, barely gets dark even at, mid even at midnight. This is the guy who bans a lot of those ospreys. 77 years old, still climbing, still climbing nests. This is what he's going up for. This would be, this would be the, the hatch, checking young at the hatch. And there's Perti, another osprey, found and banded. I want to tell you a little bit about the Finnish Osprey Center, because a lot of Europe has developed sort of mini versions of the lab of ornithology that revolve around ospreys. And they've been hugely successful. Finland in, Finland in particular, UK even, even more so, Scotland. So this is the Finnish Osprey Center. Um, if I could pronounce the word in Finnish, I would do it for you, but I can't. Potio, Potiolampi. And one of the things they do here is they um, it's, an old, it's an old trout hatchery, and ospreys were coming in there to grab trout as often as they could. So they thought, if you, can't, if, you can't, if you can't beat them, join them. So what they did is they started seeding these ponds, smaller ponds, with lots of trout, and then building these little hides right here. Guess what it costs to sit in that hide for a day? $350. You've got to sell a lot of trout to make $350. And they'll put four or five people in there. People fly in from Russia, from Japan, from the US to photograph, to get photographs like that. So, Lab of Ornithology. <laughs> I understand that there are ospreys showing up at a pond here, and it occurs to me that with just a little bit of an investment, 
that you could be charging $1,500, $2,000 a day for people to sit in a blind, take pictures of ospreys. Again, switching gears, Scotland. Um, and um, there's a rich and very interesting history of ospreys in Scotland going back hundreds of years, quite well documented. And um, I think I sketched out a little bit earlier, um, the problem there was less contaminants, less pesticides than it was um, slow, steady shooting of ospreys at fishing ponds, not just uh, in fish farms, but also at the large landed estates. Keep in mind, most of the land in northern, in Scotland, in a, in a lot of Europe, is owned by very wealthy families. Huge holdings, 50, 70, 100,000 100, acres. And those were the spots where the ospreys were, were trying to nest. Um, people were trying to protect the fishing streams, the trout streams that the, that the um, wealthy people came up for on their weekends, their weekend hunting and fishing parties. And so ospreys did not fare well. By the 1920s and 30s, there were virtually no ospreys left in, the, in, in England and Scotland. They were gone. Might have been one or two pairs way off in huge forests, but um, essentially wiped out. So there were, here's, here's where ospreys nest in. Compare this with that photo I showed you from the salt marshes in my backyard. Here's the same bird, totally different habitat, thriving in Scotland in these big tall ponds um, where they're nesting. And this, again, this is part of a huge landed estate, been owned by the same family for three, 400, 500 years. And I think they own 100,000 acres, something like that. This is where those ospreys are fishing. This happens to be a lock, an estuary, but they use the rivers, the rivers as well and um, often commuting fairly long distances, five or 10, 15 miles to, to get to them. Oop. Oh, for some reason that slide didn't come through. Anyway, there is an, also an osprey um, center in Scotland at a place called Loch Garton where the, one of the first ospreys returned in the 1950s. They began to come back Mostly scan, probably Scandinavian birds on their way migrating through up to Scandinavia. And um, like that osprey center you saw in Finland, the same thing exists in, in Scotland where one nest um, has been protected for years since the, 19, since the 1950s and they've nested there continually. Over one million people have been to see that single osprey nest in Scotland. Tremendous interest there. Here you can see the growth. Um, we've got, we're up to, they're up, up to um, somewhere between 250 and 300 nests in Scotland. They started out in 1975 with just literally a handful. This is the guy that made it all happen, or certainly one of the, one of the major guys who made it all happen. He was the first warden at Lock, at Lock Garden, Roy Dennis, great friend of mine, wonderful wildlife biologist doing just fantastic work, conservation work in Scotland and England and uh, is also spearheading a lot of the work to transfer um, birds from um, Scotland and, and uh, northern, northern Europe down into uh, the Mediterranean area and southern Europe. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Typical nest in, in, in England, this is um, 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 down in uh, near Birmingham in the um, farmland outside of, Burmi outside of Birmingham. Beautiful rolling fields, so this is the landscape pieced and plotted. And here we have an osprey nest up in one of these um, trees. The, this is um, a population that was started from Scottish birds that were hacked, were transferred down to a reservoir, um, a reservoir um, just outside of Birmingham, um, paid for by the local water company that owned, that owned the reservoir, I've set up a beautiful nature center there. They're managing three or 400 acres plus the osprey population on this, on this lake. It's a, truly a stupendous operation, really well run. If you have a chance to go, um, it's just outside of Birmingham. It's a place called Rutland Water. Um, hides, they call them hides. And there are people there uh, all the daylight hours monitoring, uh, taking notes on the osprey nest. Every single fish delivery to that nest is, is recorded and they're now something like 10 or 15 nests in this immediate area that have sprung up from that. 
Um, they've also put in a lot of work um, tracking osprey migration. So European osprey migration is particularly well known. These are satellite transmitters strapped on a, back, a backpack transmitter, which some of you may know about. And this is a track, it happens to be from Finland, but it could be from Scotland. The data are just particularly, this map is particularly good. And this is interesting because it was a single pair in southern Finland, both the male and the female were given transmitters. So you could see how the pair undertook their migrations and their wintering. And you can see they're very separate routes and very separate wintering locations. Now, my friend Rob Beregard likes to joke that the only reason ospreys can stay mated for life is because they take separate winter vacations. <laughs> <laughs> Notice here, too, that they um, both spring, um, spring and fall migration are not identical routes. They're close, but certainly not identical. Note, too, how they get across the Mediterranean. They are looking for land bridges. Italy and Sicily coming across, Malta, um, and this is, they're, here they're flying down, what, Corsica, Sardinia, and then they have to jump across from there. Now keep in mind what's on the other side of the Mediterranean. They got across that. There aren't a lot of fish there. So this is a, Four, anywhere from a four to five day, six day, six day crossing. The good news is that they can land at night. So they don't have to fly 24 hours, which they do over the water. Um, but they do it. Ocean crossings, this is lovely painting by Julie Zikafus, who did a series of watercolors from my book. Um, I, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've seen a single image that captures migration better than this painting. Overwater migration. Ospreys across the Mediterranean will fly maybe 12, 15 hours. Ospreys crossing the Caribbean, which they are ospreys do here in North America, routinely are leaving Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and flying to Northern South America. That's a 24 to 30 hour crossing. This is what they're doing day and night. Back to Europe, this is where the wintering, where the, um, this is the coast of West Africa where so many of these European birds winter. Totally different area. They settle right in, find what they need, feed on a lot of mullet. There are big schools of mullet there. That's one of their key species. They share the beaches with, um, the beaches are, are, um, mo are pro provide, are basically highways for traveling up and down, horse-drawn carriages, um, bringing, goods that are brought down from the rivers to the beaches and then transported along the beaches to the villages that are along the, along the side. Rutland Water has been fantastic at linking schools between both um, uh, Europe, between England and, uh, and, West, and West Africa. So here, um, this, this uh, Senegalese class is getting a lesson in, um, in ospreys Osprey breeding in, in Europe um, via, the, via, the, via the internet. And I know the lab has some programs that are starting to work this way as well, but this idea of linking schools in, in different parts of the world, using birds to link schools in different parts of the world is just a, a fascinating idea to me. Quick look at um, the, um, uh, how these northern European birds are being used to reseed areas that haven't had ospreys for generations. This is in the Basque regions of Spain and northern Spain. Typical hacking tower, some of you know about it. Ospreys being, being brought down from Scotland or Finland, released here. Lots of work goes into this. Um, uh, fish being cut up, they have to have fresh fish every day. And not only do they have to be fed, but when they return, and it takes them at least two years to come back after wintering in Africa to come back to these breeding grounds. They need a place to nest. So here are some of the marshes in Spain where they're building nesting platforms. So there we are. That's uh, basically the story that I wanted to tell you today. Um, I hope you've gotten a
feeling for, um, first of all, how widespread ospreys are and how they are, are being nurtured by so many different people in different parts of the world. I find it very encouraging. You know, we live in, a, in an era when it's, uh, you have to struggle to find good news about, um, about the environment. Um, those of us who keep a finger on the pulse of the planet, it's very easy to get discouraged. Uh, what UN report just came out the other day that told us we're going to lose something like a million species in the next two or three, um, two, three decades. Um, so what we see here is that it doesn't always have to be that way, that there are species that can make it back. Yes, ospreys had lots of things going for them. They were tolerant. They could nest on uh, human structures. Um, they were um, very versatile in the food that they could take, even though it was all live fish. There are lots of different kinds of live fish that they could get. Um, and they're resilient. Keep tabs on your ospreys here. I hope you'll do that for me. I really want to follow. I don't live here anymore, but I want to follow the story. I want to know what happens to Finger Lakes ospreys. So please let me know. Thank you for coming this evening. Hope you enjoyed this. I think it's time for questions, and I think apparently we have their online people that are going to ask questions as well. And you need to remind me, I need to repeat the questions. Questions, sir. So can you, um, at the southern end of the lake, it was fairly sparse for a while, and then we had a couple more pulls. Can you talk about the, um, the behavior of sort of ospreys in isolation versus kind of what the threshold behaviors are or the densities of, of a colony effect? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the question was um, um, ospreys as solitary breeders versus colonial breeders. I think that sort of is the nexus of what you're, what you're asking there. Um, and the short answer is ospreys attract other ospreys. So if you've got a breeding pair, you are more likely to um, bring in more, assuming the nest sites are there to accommodate them. Either that or they're going to fight over the nest sites, which can be to the detriment of the breeding bird that's, uh, that's already established there. So yes, I mean, they do, they are, um, as a fish eating bird, they, are, they don't have to be territorial. They can nest very close together. I have nests in my, on my Mass, Massachusetts marshes that are 30 feet apart. So they can nest very close. They're a fish eating bird, you can't, defend fish. They're moving around all the time. If you're a red-tailed hawk, you can defend a field and be sure of finding rabbits and voles there. That's not true of fish eating birds. So you get gulls and terns nest by the thousands on a very small area because they don't have to, they only have to defend their immediate nest site. That's kind of true for ospreys. Not quite as much, but almost. Tim. Yeah, um, you mentioned persecution of the birds in Europe. And I I've often went, thought myself how, you know, the way there's a lot more ospreys and peregrine falcons now, much more than there were be before DDT. You know, they've come back really strong. But, but I wonder, wasn't there a lot of persecution here, too, which was probably suppressing their numbers for maybe a century or more? I mean, commercial fishing interests and for the ospreys? And Good question. The question has to do with persecution of ospreys in Europe versus here in, uh, in North America. In Europe, it's, it's far better known, um, and it was apparently more effective because it really wiped the birds out. There were more ospreys here. That also helped. Um, good question. We really don't know. We don't have a good handle on how much persecution of ospreys was occurring here. You know, it would be anecdotal. Somebody shot one in their backyard. Um, it's, that's a really hard thing to get um, uh, good, da good data on. I'm sure it occurred. Well, I mean, there are the, the pictures from the 20s and 30s of various kinds of hawks piled up. Shot. I've even seen a couple yes. of ospreys in those. Yes. Pictures. Yeah, those were shot, the birds shot in, migra in, mi in migration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ospreys are particularly vulnerable on the breeding grounds because they nest in the open. They're not like a goshawk that's out in the middle of nowhere, hard to find. Um, so um, they, were, they were more vulnerable. What's fascinating to me is what 
and I, I have a slide, but I didn't, I didn't, I could have shown it, but I didn't. What's fascinating to me is how attitudes changed almost in one generation. Um, about nine, basically our generation, 1970s, they came, um, there was a turning point, and birds of prey were shot a lot less, um, a lot less than they had been before that. The same thing in Europe. I have a graph that, graph that shows shooting in, in Italy, where it was rampant. I mean, Italians shot everything that moved. And the number of recovered bands from Finnish ospreys dropped from, you know, two or three percent of the population banded down to almost zero percent in 20 years. So there were changing attitudes that were going on there. People were living, there were fewer people living in the country. There were more urban dwellers, so there, there weren't as many kids out with a shotgun on, on a weekend with nothing better to do than shoot what, what they could, that kind of thing. Candace, you might have some observations here. Eaton referred to ospreys as being evil birds. <laughs> that was in 1902, Yeah. You described all the other birds as being lovely plumage bears, but ospreys were evil. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that left the nest after we put a camera up oh, are definitely evil birds. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, I think, oh, sure. Mm -hmm. There's all this talk about ospreys and other birds eating too much fish, therefore they get persecuted. Is there any evidence that ospreys and say cormorants actually do decimate fish populations so humans can't have them? It's hard to lump ospreys and cormorants in the same basket because they eat very different. Oh, the question had to do with um, um, are, are ospreys taking, taking fish that uh, fishermen are interested in and therefore their conflicts arise between the fish that people want and the fish that ospreys want. And to a great extent, no. Um, they are not taking, most of the fish they take are not fish that people are that interested in. Candace can speak to the Finger Lake situation better than I can. I'm sure the occasional trout does not please people when they take those, but how many people eat bullheads? I mean, probably not that many. How many people eat carp? Not that many. And um, perch are not, you know, you're not going to go to the fish market and buy perch. So you're not putting anybody out of business by taking perch out of the southern end of Cayuga Lake. Um, and where I live, they're taking um, things like menhaden and Herring, which are essentially planktivores, they're oily fish. They're used commercially, but mostly for fish meal, not for human consumption, so. The algae booms and, um, along the East Coast and down in Florida, are those creating problems for the children? Algae blooms, are they problems for ospreys? Um, not that it's been documented. They're killing a lot of fish, so they may well they may well have an have an impact. On the on the other hand, ospreys are amazingly versatile and adaptable, and if one fish goes, they can often find fish in other places. Not always. The short answer is we don't we don't know. I don't think there are any there have certainly haven't been any studies that I know of that have looked at that. But it's um, it's a worry, and it's an increasing worry. How heavy a fish can an osprey actually lift? How heavy a fish can an osprey lift? Good question. There are, there are tales, probably apocryphal, of ospreys latching on to a fish that is so big that they get dragged underwater. Um, I'm not sure that's ever been totally documented. but. Um, and also, they can usually they can usually really usually release their fish. Ospreys weigh about um, um, about eighteen about two thousand grams. So that is, I should be able to translate into pounds off the top of my head, and I can't right now. Four or five pounds. Hmm? Four, or five pounds. Four or five pounds. There you go. And they can um, they can take a fish um, about half their weight. The males weigh less. The male ospreys lay less, le, weigh less than the females. Um, by about 15 or 20 percent, and so they are going to take somewhat smaller, and they do most of the most of the fishing for the family, so they're going to take somewhat smaller fish than the females will once once they start fishing on their own. Do we have some online questions? Uh, we do. We have a question from Montana. Um, somebody's been observing an osprey nest for about five or six years, and they've been observing it for about 
five or six years, and only just last year, I believe, they started sharing nesting responsibilities with the male sitting on the nest and the female going fishing. And he's just wondering if this is common behavior and if it's something that's more common in uh, mature pairs. I'm going to get you to repeat that because I'm not 100 percent sure about that. I'm sorry. So we have we have somebody from Montana that's yep. been observing Parabot spray for about five or six years. Yep. And just recently they started sharing nesting responsibilities with the male sitting on the nest while the female goes and collects fish. And he's wondering if this is common behavior and is this something that only more mature pairs do because he's only seen exhibit this behavior recently. Okay, should I repeat that question? Yes. So the question had to, had to, had to do with um, um, sharing the um, osprey sharing nesting duties, male, male and female, taking, um, um, each taking a, a role in, um, in, 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 in the nesting activities, incubating eggs and feeding young. And if I understand this question correctly, it had to do with a pair where apparently that wasn't happening earlier on when they were a younger pair, but it did happen later when they years later Correct. okay um that's very unusual usually um, mo most ospreys share nesting duties right away females won't put up with males that don't do that i'm very surprised that this male got away with that um but um Yes, I mean the, the typical situation is that both 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 males and females incubate. Male does all the foraging, brings all the fish to the nest. Female will leave the nest to he'll deliver the fish to the nest. Female will take that fish, go off to a separate perch away from the nest, feed on that, and while that's happening, the male will take over incubation. And that can go on for quite a long while. He can off he'll often incubate for an hour or more while the female's resting, she'll go bathing, um, and you know, just getting a break from sitting on the nest all day. But what's interesting is some males incubate a lot more than others. And so what happens is the females have to come up and actually, I've seen females actually nudge the male off the egg so she could get back on, because he wasn't gonna give it up. Females almost always incubate at night. Now, once the young hatch, that things change because the um, male no longer, he does not brood the young. The young need to be kept warm when they're small, and the female broods them, sits, sits on them, and keeps, keeps them warm. What happens then is the male brings the fish up, and she keeps it in the nest and breaks it up and delivers bits of, bits of pieces to the, um, to, the, to the young. He does his feeding before that happens away from the nest. So um, there are um, there are a few um, instances known where males did not deliver were poor were poor foragers and didn't bring in a lot of fish, and in that case the female would would leave the male would stay at the nest the female would leave and go off and um, and forage on her own and bring fish back to the nest but that's rare. Anything else? Uh, my question is about competition with other species. There have been some observations around here, myself personally too, of, of um, ospreys harassing the great blue herons. And one theory was that herons actually are predate, can predate or can prey on the young ospreys or the eggs. Is that true or would it be more like competition for food or nest types? Has to do with, the question has to do with um, um, ospreys seeing herons, I guess in this case green herons. Great. Great blue herons, yes. Okay, that makes sense. Seeing herons as um, 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 being aggressive toward them, chase, chasing them, and I've seen the same. I've seen the same thing, and I'm pretty sure they see them as predators because they can come up when an osprey chick is is that big, the size of your thumb, twice the size of your thumb. It's going to be a tasty little morsel for a great blue heron. And they are remarkably agile at getting up into, into nests. Um, so yes, ospreys will not tolerate great blue herons near their nest at all. I've seen them chasing them time and time and again, and it usually works. Um, a a um, a female osprey whose whose um, dander is up 
and he's flying hard at you at about 45 miles an hour is something that any great blue heron is going to get out of the way from fast. How do they pair up? Does the male try to attract the female, you know, if he doesn't have a pair, have a mate? Um, what is that process? And, and Good question. How, the question is how, how do osprey um, how do ospreys form pairs? And um, a lot of it has to do with a nest site. You don't have pairs forming. The, the pair coalesces around a nest site. It could be the male that arrives there first. It could be the female that finds a spot where she, where she wants the nest. But once they have the site, another, that's going to be um, something that attracts um, another bird, a, 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 a potential mate in, in, into that site. In other words, they're not going to form, they don't, they don't form pairs on the wintering grounds. They don't form pairs in migration. They migrate alone. They winter alone. They only form pairs when they come back to the breeding grounds. And those pairs almost always form around nest sites. And that's a lifetime, or generally a lifetime pairing? It is, but keep in, is, is it a lifetime pairing is the question. Um, ospreys do pair for life, but keep in mind that they, uh, adult mortality is about 10% a year. So do the math. You know, you think about it, and, and in five years, you have a very good chance of having lost one of the two mates having died in that, in that period. If you lost 10% of your friends every year, you would have, you wouldn't have many friends at the end of the, you know, at the end of the, at, at the end of a decade. That's essentially what, os that's the way ospreys live. Thank heavens we don't. We're not, we don't have that situation, but ospreys, do, but they're very quick. They're very quick to find a new mate, especially if they have a nest site. If you you have a you have a, if you have a nest a nest site and you're single and sitting around there, the <laughs> odds are real good you're going to have a mate very quickly. Okay, let's do one more, and then I think I'm I'm. Well, on average, how long does an osprey live? Yeah, life to um. How long do ospreys live? Um. They will, um, that's a tough question because some of them live a long time, most of them die young. So in the first year of life, um, once they fledge and leave the nest, that next 12 months, 50% are gonna die in that period. So for every, every two young that leaves the Finger Lakes, only one of them is gonna come back and actually let probably less than that because you've got another year year in there. So 50% die in the first year. After that, it's the wheat from the chaff. They are the lucky from the unlucky, a combination of those two. They weeded out um, pretty much everybody who wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna make it, um, especially my, migration is a big filtering factor. It gets rid of a lot of the birds that, that um, just don't have it. To, to complete that migration. From there on, it's about 10% a year. So um, if you look at, there, there are several ways of answering this question. If you look at the age structure of the population, in other words, if you look, if you take the median age of that population, uh, most populations, it would be somewhere around eight to seven to nine years, something like that. But there are, os I have trapped ospreys with bands, convincing evidence that we're over 20 years old. We've had ospreys as old as 27, I think, have been known to be breeding. But that's, it's one in a thousand, one in 10,000, I don't know. It's, it's sort of like, it's sort of in human terms, it's kind of like the person that lives to be 105. You can do it, but the odds are pretty slim that it's gonna, ha gonna happen. No, but, and the other difference is that um, ospreys are still breeding at 105. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for coming. Okay, so this is me, no? Are they able to release the towns if they get a big